Jennifer Homans, the founding director of the Center for Ballet and the Arts. And I'm here to welcome you to today's event, Why Nijinska is Important, with Lynn Garifola, the author of the new book, La Nijinska, Choreographer of the Modern. Just a couple of words about the center before we begin. Um, the center exists to bring together scholars and artists working on dance, both in our fellowship program and in our public events and programs. So I'm especially happy that Lynn, who has done so much to further serious scholarship in dance, so much, has agreed to join us here today. Lynn is Professor Emerita of Dance at Barnard College at Columbia University, as most of you know. And I'm not going to go through her bio because I want to take the full time uh, on her comments. So please find her full bio in the chat, along with a link to the book, Lana Jinska, as well as any further information that you may wish to have about CBA and our future events. Just a quick map of today before I, I turn it over to Lynn. I, she will speak for about 30 minutes. We will then see a little bit of film. And when she's finished with her presentation, we'll take questions from the audience. So please click on the Q&A button as usual to ask your questions. And we will get to as many as we possibly can in the time we have. If you need tech help, please privately message the host, Christian, Duraso in the chat, and she will do her best to help. She's really a marvel at this. And because we're in the Zoom world, alas, but we're still very happy to be here, we will end promptly at 4 p.m. So forgive if we don't get to all of the questions, and I hope there will be another opportunity for us all to gather soon. So Lynn, welcome, and please take it away with Lana Jinska. <laughs> Well, thank you, Jennifer, for inviting me to present about Nijinska here at CBA, where I've attended many wonderful programs in the past. And thank you, Andrea, Courtney, and Kristin for making everything go so smoothly. Um, I dedicate this event, alas, to the dancers of Ukraine. So now to Nijinska. Overshadowed in life and legend by her celebrated brother, Vaslav Nijinska, Nijinsky, Bronislav Nijinska had a far longer and more productive career. She was an architect of 20th century neoclassicism who experienced the transformative power of, of the Russian Revolution and created her greatest work under the continuing influence of its avant-garde. Many of her ballets rested on the probing of gender boundaries, a mistrust of conventional gender roles, and the heightening of the ballerina's technical and artistic prowess. A key figure of Russia abroad, she contributed to the many diasporic or emigre companies, including her own short-lived ensembles, that dotted the ballet landscape of the interwar decades. A freelance choreographer who traveled widely, she also played a crucial role in the international dissemination of ballet modernism. Finally, she was the author of an acclaimed volume of memoirs, in addition to a major treatise on movement, although little of what she wrote was published in her lifetime. Her career sheds new light on the modern history of ballet and of modernism more generally, recuperating the memory of lost works and forgotten artists, many of them women. Next slide, please. Born in Minsk, the capital of Belarus on December 27th, 1890, that's old style. Um, new style would be early January, 1891. Nijinska was the third and youngest child of Thomas Nijinsky and Eleonora Bereda, Polish dancers who spent the better part of their careers performing in opera houses throughout the Southern and Western reaches of the Russian empire. In other words, Nijinska grew up and her parents uh, danced throughout the entire area that we know today as um, that is now being decimated with bombs or um, receiving vast numbers of refugees. For Nijinska, it was an enchanted childhood as the family moved from city to city. Um, and like all idols, it came to an end. In 1897, just before Nijinska turned seven, a new partner stole her handsome father away. Deserting his family to live with her, Thomas left a wound in his daughter's heart that would never heal. 
By then, Eleonora and her children were living in St. Petersburg, where she was determined they would attend the city's famed Imperial Ballet School. Vaslav was admitted in 1898, followed two years later by Branislava. When she graduated in 1908, she became a member of the corps de ballet of the Mariinsky Theater, home to the Imperial Opera and Imperial Ballet. Next, please. However, it was as a member of Serge Diaghilev's newly formed Ballet Russe, which she joined at its outset in 1909, that Nijinska experienced the artistic awakening to which she owed her future as a choreographer. She danced in all of Michel Fouquin's innovative ballets and took a prominent role in Vaslav's um, experimental works. Nijinska's body was the clay on which her brother molded his first landmark ballet, Afternoon of a Fawn in 1912, and its controversial successor after uh, the Rite of Spring in 1913. She learned how hard it was to invent movement and to make her body move in unfamiliar ways, but also that making ballets was something she thought she could do and wanted to do. Diaghilev, however, refused to support her ambitions. Next, please. Um, Nijinska returned to St. Petersburg in 1914 and spent the next seven years in Russia and, and Ukraine, mainly in Ukraine. Caught up in the revolutionary movement, she became a leading figure of the choreographic avant-garde. In Moscow in 1918, she drafted her first treatise, The School and Theater of Movement, which revealed her profound disillusionment with ballet of the late imperial period, her vision of a new abstract ballet, and her goal of creating what she called intelligent, committed artists, rather than, quote, professional dancers trained as she had been for nothing but stage performance. In, 19, in Kiev in 1919, she opened the School of Movement, um, which became the center of her artistic explorations. Here in an atmosphere of what Ukrainian scholars Vilana Tach and Irina Makarik have called jubilant experimentation, she choreographed her first abstract works, trained and rehearsed her first company of dancers, and worked with avant-garde theater directors and painters, including the artist Vadim Meller, who created powerful images of her dancing. Next, please. These are a few of Meller's um, designs. Um, Nijinska left Kiev in 1921. During their years of separation, Vaslav had become mentally ill and it was hoped that her presence would snap him back to health. It didn't. And so with a mother and two children to support, she rejoined the Ballet Russe. Diaghilev welcomed her back both as a dancer and as a choreographer, using her as he had once used her brother to reinvigorate the repertory. During the next four years, Nijinska created eight ballets and contributed dances to a dozen operas. Many were collaborations with composers of the French modernist group known as Les Cis, and visual artists from the elite ranks of international modernism. Next, please. She choreographed two ballets to scores by Stravinsky, including her 1923 masterwork, Les Nos, which brought to the Western stage the abstract architectural forms and impersonal human masses of post-revolutionary constructivism, leading some critics to denounce the work as Bolshevik. From the start, Les Nos was also recognized as a milestone. Um, uh, one of the quote, handful of great ballets that could sustain comparison with the finest achievements in any medium, in the words of an English critic writing about a later revival. With all the women dancing on point, Lenos was a key work in the emergence of ballet neoclassicism. This was also true of Le, of Le Biche, a ballet of sexual ambiguity set among the, the era's bright young things in which Nijinska as the hostess wore ropes of pearls inspired by Chanel, but dance the bravura steps of a man. Those years with Diaghilev catapulted her to the elite ranks of 20th century ballet, earning her a privileged place in the history of ballet modernism. In achieving this kind of recognition as a ballet choreographer, Nijinska was a rarity. There was no shortage of women who choreographed in the ballet idiom, but few worked for elite institutions or enjoyed the privilege of authorship. Most choreograph for popular entertainment or for their students, a form of ballet making open to women even at schools affiliated with elite institutions, although nearly always choreography was folded into their identity as teachers, which did not necessarily happen with men. 
Dujenska was certainly aware of these female practices. Her own mother had found work staging dances in operettas, and Nijinska had danced in several ballets by her teacher, Claudia Kulichevskaya. However, as Nijinska surely knew, uh, dances choreographed by women seldom outlived their original production, coalesced into a repertory, or earned their makers recognition as choreographers. By admitting Nijinska into the elite circle of ballet Russe choreographers, Diaghilev rescued Nijinska from these semi-visible female practices, extolling the merit of her work and insisting upon its place in a modernist succession. In 1925, Dia uh, Nijinska left the Ballet Russe and embarked on a career as a freelance choreographer. Over the next 45 years, she worked with numerous companies, creating new ballets and reviving old ones, in addition to staging the works of other choreographers, such as her brother and also Fokin. Next, please. At great personal expense and partly on credit, she formed two short-lived companies for which she choreographed some of her most personal works. The first, which Diaghilev did his best to sabotage, reunited her with the painter Alexandra Exter, fresh from Soviet Russia, who made the splendid costume designs. The second, which culminated in a version of Hamlet in which she played the title role, left her bankrupt and her entire stock of scenery and costumes impounded thanks to a shady Russian impresario. She spent several uh, seasons, um, next please. She spent several seasons at the Teatro Colón in Buenos Aires, where she contributed decisively to the professionalization of the ballet company and its modernization and the modernization of its repertory. In 1928, Nijinska was engaged by Ida Rubinstein to form a ballet troupe. Next, please. Um, exotically beautiful and immensely wealthy, Rubinstein ha had originated roles in Diaghilev's Cleopatra and Scheherazade. Decamping from the Ballet Russe, she established herself as an independent producer, commissioning elaborate multidisciplinary works with high profile collaborators in which she invariably starred. Trained as an actress and celebrated for her gestural express expressiveness, Rubinstein itched to become a classical ballerina. This desire certainly complicated Nijinska's task as choreographer, but it gave her the means to form a company that included two future choreographers, David Lechim and the great Frederick Ashton, and scores of talented youngsters, many supporting impoverished emigre families. Thanks to Rubinstein, Nijinska added to her grow growing repertory, Stravinsky's Le Baiser de la Fée, two, two ballets by Ravel, Bolero and Lavals, and The Swan Princess, a Russian legend inspired by Pushkin. Nijinska was always on the move. She worked virtually nonstop between 1919, when she founded the School of Movement, and 1972, when she died with a contract in hand to stage Les Biches in Dusseldorf. Always short of money, ever on the lookout for jobs, she worked with companies in Buenos Aires, Warsaw, Brescia, Paris, London, Chicago, Buffalo, Vienna, and Rome, and there were more. The studio was her laboratory and she unfailingly began the day teaching class before choreographing and, and rehearsing. She left her mark on generations of dancers included celebrated ballerina muses such as, next please, Alicia Markova, next, Alexandra Danilova, and next, Rosella Hightower, all of whom paid warm tribute to the impact of her coaching. And there in the middle, you see Nijinska partnering um, uh, Hightower in the studio. And then they scattered, seeding far-flung companies while her own dancer, dances, nearly all created for short-lived ensembles, disappeared. As she approached her 80th birthday, she felt that nothing remained of her passage through decades of ballet history. Nijinska's career challenges the familiar narrative of 20th century ballet history in the West, which begins with Diaghilev's Ballet Russe, continues in the 1930s and 40s with the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo, directed by uh, Colonel de Basile and the uh, Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo, led by Sergei Denham, and culminates in the Royal Ballet and New York City Ballet. The vast majority of ballet books focus on some aspect of these companies, their genesis, repertory style, critics, aesthetic orientation and stellar artistic personnel. Building on one another, 
uh, they reinforce the te teleologies and myths surrounding each company while insisting upon the centrality of its works to the ballet canon. This narrative is as notable for what it excludes as for what it encompasses. With the exception of Diaghilev's Ballet Russe, Nijinska had only limited access to these companies and none at all to the New York City Ballet, although she trained some of um, its early dancers. Yet she worked constantly. Next, please. Her life thus fleshes out the history of the interwar years with its numerous ensembles of adopting the Ballet Russe name, such as her own, and others espousing the aesthetics of ballet modernism, although lying far from its European centers. It spotlights the many companies headed by women, Karina Ari, Ida Rubinstein, Vera Nemtinova, Alicia Markova, Ruth Page, Catherine Littlefield, Mona Inglesby, Ruby Rambert, to say nothing of Nijinska's own ensembles, all of which with the partial exception of Ballet Rambert, um, uh, the Ida Rubinstein company and Page's companies mostly lie beyond the notice of his existing historiography. Nijinska's works significantly alter our understanding of abstraction in 20th century ballet, a subject dominated by the great corpus of works created by, uh, choreographed by George Balanchine beginning in the 1940s and Leonid Messiaen's sim so-called symphonic ballets of the 1930s with Fokin's Chopiniana, Les Sylphides um, and Fedor Lopuchov's Dance Symphony as precursors. Yet Nijinska was central to this history. Beginning with her lost works of the Kiev years, she choreographed both pot, plotless and semi-plotless ballets, as well as modernist narratives, offering a highly original approach to ballet aesthetics, composition, and technique. At the same time, her work complicates the notion that the shift away from demi character to classical styles in the post diaghilev period was mainly the work of Balanchine and Frederick Ashton. Actually, it was Nijinska, who began to explore the variety and abundance of classical forms as early as the 1920s. Approaching the Danse des Cales through the prism of modernism not only gave her choreography its distinctive flavor, but also expanded the lexicon and syntax of classical technique, above all in the area of female virtuosity. Next, please. Um, Nijinska first came to the United States in 1934 when she choreographed the dances in Max Reinhardt's pioneering film, A Midsummer Night's Dream, and you see a rehearsal of that there. She returned um, in 1939 at the outset of World War II, part of a wave of stateless Russian dancers en route to their second diaspora. Next, please. Settling in California, she began to work with a group of gifted young dancers, including Betty Marie, later Maria Tallchief, her sister Marjorie Tallchief, and Sid Charisse. She traveled frequently to New York, where she contributed works to American Ballet Theater and Sergei Denham's Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo, only to find herself undercut by muscle-flexing Americans or Russians who had sunk roots in the US. She formed a long-term relationship with Ballet International, founded in New York in 1944 by the Marquis de Cuevas, who then later relocated it to Monte Carlo and then Paris. In the Franco-Russian American atmosphere of the Grand Ballet du Marquis de Cuevas, Nijinska, who had never learned to speak English proper, uh, fluently, felt at home. But in the post work at dance capitals of New York and London, she dropped from sight and memory of her and memory of her work faded. Um, transnational has in an era of national canons. During the most creative part of her career, Nijinska was widely recognized as a truly great artist in the words of Tenf Sean. By the early 1960s, however, Nijinska's ballets had all but disappeared from the stage. Next, please. Hence, the significance of her revivals of Les Biches in 1964 and Les Noces in 1966 by Britain's Royal Ballet, now directed by her former dancer, Frederick Ashton. These splendid productions, which were filmed, notated and maintained in repertory were crucial to the survival of these ballets and to the solidifying of Nijinska's reputation. This recuperative effort was reinforced by the publication in 1981, nine years after her death of early memoirs and the restaging of Lenos that year in California by the Oakland Ballet. 
Five years later, the exhibition, Branislava Nijinska, A Dancer's Legacy, curated by Nancy Van Norman Baer, showcased for the first time her collaboration with Alexandra Exter, um, while challenging the belief that Balanchine was the sole progenitor of ballet classicism, neoclassicism. The Nijinska who emerges on the pages of her surviving Keep diary is emotionally fragile, but utterly committed to her students and what she calls her creativity. That's the word again and again and again that appears in her diaries. Emigration transformed her. A woman in what was universally considered a man's job, she learned to be ruthless. She drove her dancers mercilessly working them morning to night, compelling them to enter her imaginative world and collaborate wholeheartedly in the creation of new work, a phenomenon far closer to the kind of relationship that existed between Mary Bigman or, or Martha Graham and their dancers than between ballet masters and dancers at institutions like the Paris Opera or the Mariinsky. She gave few interviews and trusted only her family and a small circle of intimates. She was paranoid, often with good reason, and her rudeness was legendary. She made decisions she came to regret, stubbornly refused to compromise, and was often her own worst enemy. Nothing came easy to her. Again and again, she had to prove herself, starting from scratch, even when she was a respected professional, which is still the case for many women choreographers in ballet. And the carapace, that she developed was partly a response to the misogyny she encountered in most quarters of the ballet world. Again and again, her, accomplish, her accomplishments were disparaged, her works misrepresented, and her presence both as a dancer and a choreographer slighted or ignored. More often than not, she remains on the sidelines of her own history, willfully unremembered or diminished by the accurate but demeaning uh, sobriquet, Nijinsky's sister. Nijinska left, left a trove of writings that reveal the woman behind her public mask. This is especially true of her diaries from the late 1920s and 1930s. Next, please. Here is the story of her love, unspoken, hidden from all but a single close friend for the great Russian basso, Fedor Shaliapin. Nijinska had met him in the spring of 1911 in Monte Carlo, and he singled her out, telling Diaghilev that she was very gifted. Nothing happened between them. But unlike, but like the muse's fatal kiss in the Baiser de la Fée, their encounter marked the dawn of her creative self-awareness, the moment of her birth as an artist and a woman. Nijinska's unconsummated and unrequited love allowed her to assert an identity that did not come easily to women in ballet to assuage the guilt she felt in pursuing her path or destiny as an independent creative artist. Next, please. Yes. Um, in Nijinsku's case, the guilt was compounded because of her family and especially her children who were mainly raised by their grandmother assisted by family friends as their mother left for weeks and months at a time always putting her career first. Nijinsku's voice in her diaries insists upon a femininity belied by the objectivity of her ballets and by her increasingly authoritarian uh, behavior in the studio. Nothing could be more different from Nijinska's public persona than the intensely emotional eye of the diaries where her ambition, assertiveness, potency, and strength lay safely concealed under cover of extreme subjectivity. The 1930s were not only a time of great econom economic precarity for Nijinska, but also of personal tragedy. Her mother died in 1932 and her 15 year old son three years later in a car accident. Uh, actually after showing some of the first symptoms of his uncle's illness. The first books about Vaslav filled with inaccuracies appeared and with their quote revelations about his relationship with Diaghilev left her profoundly disturbed even as they relegated her to the sidelines. Meanwhile, a struggle was taking place over Diaghilev's legacy and the consolidation of the Ballet Russe canon. Here again, Nijinska lost out, as this canon, as defined by the de Basile Company, centered on the pre-World War I ballets by Fokin. In other words, this was a canon that eliminated all of Nijinska's works for Diaghilev, as well as Balanchine's, and all of Stravinsky's ballets for Diaghilev, uh, composed after 
Vitrushka, in other words, a canon eviscerated of modernism. Far more egregiously than Diaghilev, de Basile used Nijinska, dangling promises of commissions that fell through and unceremoniously dumping her when she had served his purpose. Leon Wozikowski, a leading Polish dancer with the uh, Diaghilev company, also did his best to toss her out of the Diaghilev family while undermining her position with the organizers of the Polish ballet, whose directorship he assumed once Nijinska was out of the way. Unlike many emigres, Nijinska never turned against the Soviet Union, a stance that earned her em the enmity of critics such as Andrei Levinson. One senses her nostalgia for Russia in Les Nos and other ballets, and in the floodgate of ancestral memories that, that opened when she visited uh, Bielowicz, a former Rom uh, Romanov hunting lodge on Poland's border with Belarus, where she stood for the first time in 16 years on Russian soil. How great my heart feels here, she wrote in her diary. This was in 1938. Next, please. When Soviet ballet companies began touring abroad during the Cold War, she sought out Galina Ulanova and Yuri Grigorovich in the hope of staging Les Nos at the Bolshoi Theater. And in 1970, she taught her brother's Afternoon of Buffon to members of the Kirov Ballet in Holland, a project, however, that never reached the stage. In the 1960s, she enjoyed an epistolary friendship with the Leningrad ballet historian Vera Krasovskaya that spanned several years. And during the same decade, she renewed contact with former students from the School of Movement, discovering through their letters her own younger self, full of passion for her art and buoyed by the love and admiration for her dancers. I have tried to tell the story of this remarkable woman and artist, not only through her own words, but also through those of her contemporaries. I've quoted liberally from reviews to suggest what her lost ballets looked like, um, how a variety of critics responded to them and how their responses reflected social and political as well as cultural concerns. I've incorporated the recollections published as well as unpublished of generations of dancers who worked with her, thereby adding another set of voices to the narrative. And I've made extensive use of her voluminous correspondence. She was really a pack rat. Letters she saved and the drafts of letters she sent, which reveal her capacity for friendship, especially with women. Above all, I've tried to recreate the context in which she worked to understand how her art was shaped simultaneously by the cate cate cataclysmic events of the 20th century and the often egregious operation of sexism. Finally, I've sought to show how looking at 20th century ballet history through the lens of this unique artist makes that world appear different, revealing female critics, choreographers, ballet masters, and directors long expunged from the master narrative of ballet history. So thank you. Lynn, thank you so much. This was just wonderful. Um, and it was wonderful to be able to see some of what you were, were talking about and what you've talked about in the book. For anyone who hasn't read it yet, I can just tell you that the, the, the volume of research in this book is just um, extraordinary and you have that uh, wonderful feeling of somebody who, who has known their subject for so very long. And so there's that kind of um, deep intimacy with, with the person, which I thought I, 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 I'm going to just ask the first question while we gather some other questions and I, I was thinking about this and the, the long relationship that you've had with her and the ways in which you've been thinking about her for so many years. And I wonder, um, I mean, this is sort of two questions, two related questions. I wonder if you could say something a little bit about, I mean, it's such a complicated life and you can see, you know, in any of us as women, you could see, you know, the children and the the loss that she experienced and the life that she lived. It's amazing she did anything. Um, but, um, you know, what was it that that drove her? Really what, like, you know, the contrast you draw out between the, the sort of feminine interior and the diaries and then this kind of masculine armor that she was wearing, or if I can call it that. and. Mm. And you know, so so that's one thing. And then the other thing I was curious about was, you know, the the dances themselves are so 
extraordinary, the ones that we have. And I mean, I, I still remember the first time I saw the Ignos, I'll never forget it. It was just one of those life-changing moments for the way you understand dance. And, and yet, right, and yet. And so, you know, I'm wondering whether there's something in that you found in sort of the quality of her movement in the, and I was really interested in what you said about her classes and the, the, mm -hmm. the sort of full body movement and the breath and the, the ways in which she, um, you know, was there something in the movement itself that made people, that, that, that in part caused this kind of eraser of her that you're talking about, this sort of sense that she was made invisible before she could next make another move. So those would be my two just sort of starting questions for you before we turn to everyone else. Um, I would say that one of the things that made it hard to keep, uh, certain things were hard to keep in repertory. For instance, Lenos is not an easy work to keep in repertory. You need to have umpteen, uh, you need to have umpteen singers, you have more than 30 dancers, you have- um, Two pianos. <laughs> Four pianos, a oh, yeah. concert pianist, pianist, and all the percussion. So it's not an easy piece to keep in repertory. And it depends. You can't get around, well, I'll kind of go off here, and it doesn't really matter. It's not like Petrushka. If you're in the crown in Petrushka, it doesn't matter really what happens. But it does matter if you're in Les Nos at that moment when all of the royal ballet is up in the air and some of those jumps. It's a thrilling moment. But that doesn't come without enormous amounts of practice, um, and enormous amounts of rehearsal. Um, moreover, some of the, um, the precision of some of the movement also make, makes it difficult, I think, to keep something in, um, in repertory, to keep it in good, um, in good repair. And that's something that's, again, not necessarily the case of some of Fokine's works, for instance where there's a much more fluid and flexible um, approach to what is, you know, even in some instances, a kind of improvisational, something closer to improvisation um, in the performance on stage. And I don't think this was the case uh, for Nijinska, even when she was, even in her, when she did her own uh, Petrushka, um, things were much more choreographed. Uh, there's a work that I've always wanted to see. It was one of the ones that she did um, for the Polish ballet in 1937. And it was a kind of, um, it was set in the 16th century and it's, um, it was apparently a wonderful um, ballet full of these market scenes and other things, but so choreographed down to the groups and everything that the critic for the Dancing Times went to see it like four and five, as many times as he could during this brief season in Paris, um, because every time he went, he kept seeing new things, new things about the relationship to the music, new things about the groups and the inter... So that kind of intricacy is very difficult. Another problem was, as I said, she didn't trust anyone and neither her husband who was uh, her second husband was Nicholas Singayevsky. He was a dancer, but he certainly was not someone who would be able to um, bring back any of her stage, any of her works, nor her daughter, who was in some of the works in the 1930s, late 20s, was able to restage the works. So this made it very, um, this made it um, difficult. She didn't have a team, if you will, to keep things intact. Um, and so when she came to the United States, she kept trying to get things back into repertory. Well, ABT at some point was interested in Les Biches, but the music was, it's World War II, the music is back in Europe, so can't get it. Um, then uh, she wanted to do her Baiser de la Fée, but there was a Baiser de la Fée, which Balanchine had choreographed, and her stuff, her sets and costumes were back in France, so she couldn't get them. So it's one thing after another after another um, that goes on like that. And she's still desperately trying to uh, revive and keep in repertory um, things. So that's, I think, another 
um, problem, not only that she didn't have a company, but she didn't have this kind of team that would be able to, um, to actually, um, uh, you know, to actually set these um, works. Now, did you, you had another question? Um, oh, I can't hear you. Oh. Jennifer, I can't hear you. Unmute yourself. Did I unmute now? You can hear me yeah, now. Yeah, now I hear you. No, it just had to do with, you know, what, you know, and I don't want to take too much of our time because I want other people to have a chance, but just, you know, you know her so well. What What is your sort of instinctive almost, you know, what drove her through all the, because it was not easy. I think she felt she belonged to a tribe of artists and that that was her birthright. Uh, and that was the most important thing for her. She did have friends who weren't dancers, um, but nevertheless, her artistry was in the studio, was the, uh, belonging to this tribe. And I think once she realized that she could make dances and she could move people around and that people responded to her, I think that became a kind of aphrodisiac, if you will, for her um, that was more powerful than anything, any sort of romantic relationship that she had, um, <laughs> except with Shelley Appin, which was completely unconsummated. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Hello, Lynn. I am here to ask some of the questions from okay. the audience. I'm going to start by combining two questions that have to do with Nijinska's family. Mm -hmm. uh, Kathy Sullivan asks, who was the father of her children? Okay. And Linda Keenan was interested in knowing whether either of her children were dancers or choreographers in their own right. Okay. Um, the father of her children was a dancer who had been a Bolshoi dancer before joining the Ballet Russe, and his name was Alexander Kochetovsky or Sasha. Um, they uh, had one child, they then separated, then they had a reconciliation and had a second child, and then she caught him with a ballerina in Odessa, I think, and he fled, or she threw him out. Mm -hmm. Her second husband was Nicholas Singayevsky, and he, in, in many respects, was the one who was a father figure, certainly to the boy, you know, to her younger son. Um, she, the two children, um, one was Irina Nijinska, who uh, began to dance um, with the uh, with the Ida Rubinstein company and appeared in her mother's companies uh, when her mother was based in West, you know, in the, in the 1930s. She was quite injured in the, um, in the automobile accident that killed her brother. The brother was not a dancer. However, Nijinska was sure he was going to be a great, um, a, a great composer. I don't know how, I think much of that was wishful thinking. I showed some of his material, some of his sketches to someone who didn't think terribly much of them. Thank you. The next question comes from Lauren Johnson, who wants to know, did, did, did Nijinska use her technique classes for movement experimentation as Golizovsky and later Balanchine had done? Or was class a more traditional daily routine followed by creative choreographic work in rehearsal? Um, I think it was a mixture. I think she had, a, from what I understand, she had a fairly quick bar um, and that it was fairly, um, that was fairly traditional. But then all the bar, bar work was then um, repeated in the center, sometimes on Demi Point, which meant that there, she was trying to, striving to create um, a strength, inculcate strength, especially strength in the, um, in the torso. And, uh, and then she would, in a way, go through the rest of the class, everyone had to do pirouettes. She was said, to, people said, people have told me that she would touch them and they would do double pirouettes. I, <laughs> I don't know. Her classes were very often long. They were often two hours. 
So the, all the jumps got in at the end and she would sometimes start weaving together long combinations. She did uh, um, at some point when she felt someone had stolen her choreography, Nina Novak from the uh, denim uh, ballet russe, um, she became very irate because she said that some of the that some of the material from Brahms Variations, which was not a, which was a work she did for other companies, um, that she had used that in her class, and therefore this Nina Novak knew this material, and then she was just using it for her own work. Um, who knows? But nevertheless, her choreography was cycled through some of her work, and I think she worked on new things as well. Gabriella Estrada asks, could you tell us more about her time and contributions to the Teatro Colón in Argentina? Her contributions were really um, enormous because she was there for two years um, in 1926, the season that began April 26 through November 26. Remember the seasons are the opposite. So, um, and then she came back the next year for the same kind of eight, nine month season where she basically did everything. So she would give class in the morning, she would choreograph, she would stage things. She um, even staged Les Nos on them. Uh, and in fact, she's first staged Les Nos within six months of the first time it was danced in England, which is you know pretty astonishing. Um, she also, uh, did adaptations of work she had done for the Paris Opera, as well as for um, her own, you know, her own company, and some Diaghilev things. She did a, a version of Le Train Bleu that basically eliminated Cocteau. <laughs> That's how much she kind of got to detest him <laughs> and what he was trying to make her do with that in the uh, French in the French performance. Then she went back in 1933 for another um, nine-month season. And that was when she began setting not only some of her ballets that she had um, worked on for her own company in 1932, but also um, she adapted some of her Ida Rubinstein ballets. So um, the uh, fairy's kiss, Le Baiser de la Fée, which had been done with Rubinstein as the fairy and which was not a very, um, she basically re-choreographed that as a ballerina role. So you had two ballerina roles in the um, in that new, in the version that she did there. So she used that, um, the Colon is a way of, again, um, keeping works in repertory, changing them, move, uh, working with them, um, adapting them, and you know, all of, you know, all of those things. And then she went back in she went back in 1936 when Stravinsky to oversee the um, rehearsals of some Stravinsky ballets. Stravinsky was down doing a big uh, festival of his works, in, uh, and she flew down from um, she flew down from New York where she had just staged Les Nos for the um, the uh, de Basile Company, and. And then she went back in 1946, but something happened and I never got to the bottom of it. And there's very little, there's no correspondence left in Buenos Aires, the, the Teatro Colón, it seems to have disappeared. And, um, and there it was a different atmosphere. It was now the, a, a period of the Peronistas were in, in power. So she came back in other words, but I would say that those first two seasons and then the season in 1933, because they were so long and because she was working so intimately with this first group of dancers for um, uh, of the uh, first decade of, of a permanent company at the Colón that she had a, an incalculable um, impact. We have another question about her global reach, and that mm -hmm. comes from Louis Godbout, who asks, did Nijinska have any relationship with the Swedish ballet through Russian avant-garde artists such as Laronova and Goncha Korova? Okay, she certainly, um, Larionov, um, Mikhail Larionov and uh, 
Natalia Goncharova were certainly friends of hers. And she worked on several occasions with um, Goncharova, who after all was the designer of Les Nos. Um, she also invited her back to be the designer of um, for her own company, um, certain adapt she did the adaptation of Bolero uh, for her for Nijinska's own company in 1932 and other things. So there was a close relationship there, and I think she just liked her. <laughs> you know, I think they liked one another. And there were, and what I did find was that there were a number of uh, women artists who would pop up in as I was looking at her works. I mean, there was one who became, I became very fascinated with, the one who did the, um, that 16th century um, Polish ballet that was designed by a woman artist, Teresa Brasowska, and who was actually born in Kiev, but from a Polish background and had left and had settled in Warsaw. So I guess Nijinska must have felt very much at home that she could speak mostly Russian with some Polish and the other probably spoke more Polish and a little Russian. Um, but there was a close relationship uh, there. And so uh, there are these women who crop up around in her, in her life, just as there are Polish artists who crop up in her life. You know, why is, you know, there's a Polish artist who designed something that she does in, uh, in Chicago. He's Polish American. There's a, um, she gets a Polish composer with whom she'd worked in the Polish ballet to, um, orchestrate something for her. So there are these ways in which you see the threads of her history, threads of her past running through her history. Thank you, Lynn. We are at four o'clock, so we're going to have to, to end our Q&A session. We will take note of the questions here and try to share them with Lynn and get some answers for everyone um, as we can. Um, but we are just very appreciative of your, your, your joining us today. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you all very, very, very much. Uh, I just wanna say, Lynn, thank you. And thank you to um, the CBA team, Andrea, Courtney, and Christian. Thank you to the audience for joining us. But Lynn, especially thank you to you for, for writing this book and for, for bringing it to us today. Um, finally, I'm, I'm uh, going to tell you that we have another event coming up on March 31st, Performance in Contemporary South Africa, and I hope you'll join us for that. Mm -hmm. um, but in the meantime, Lynn, thank you so much. And um, it's hard to know what to say. I hate the end of Zooms. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can all applaud each other. Yeah. So. <laughs> thank you. Applaud you and thank you to the audience for being here. And I'm sorry we couldn't all be in person, but soon. All right. All the best, everyone.